So in the previous segment on population ecology, we looked at density dependent and density independent factors that help generally to stabilize a population. Well, some populations cycle between large and small, sort of a boom and bust. You can see with the locust swarm in the larger image, this is obviously a boom period. But then all the locusts will die off, they'll go through a hibernation period, and you'll have this bust period, which obviously is going to be a density dependent factor and is going to influence the number of locust predators that are around. You can see the same sort of cyclic pattern with the snowshoe hare and the fox in the image below. As the rabbit population increases, so too following that does the fox population, and once it dwindles, then the fox dwindles along with it. So you've probably heard the, the myth that lemmings will, you know, go jump off of cliffs and commit suicide when their populations get too big. And so, <clears throat> some people have asked if that's true, and of course, no, it's not. But as you can see in the image here, when lemmings have a large population burst, they also tend to have a migratory pattern. And when they are migrating, you will then have a massive die-off because of a large number of predators, whether it's a mongoose or a cat or various uh, predatory birds. Their population is going to decline, not because they're jumping off of a cliff, but because they're getting eaten. <clears throat> and this ties into back with the idea of population ecology and especially human impact on it on maximum sustainable yield. And again on the right you can see the mathematical model in the graph where the maximum sustainable yield is at half of the carrying capacity. So where you have that theoretical carrying capacity, that K, if you take half of that population, whether it's shrimp like you see in the image to the left, whether it's lobsters or oysters like we talked about before, it doesn't matter, but you have to leave enough that they have a viable population that the population can grow once again after you've harvested what you're interested in. And this is a wonderful idea, but it's practically impossible to implement, and we're going to look a little bit as to why that is. So pretty much any natural resource job, and we have a lot of government jobs, that are re natural resource managers. And they can never do their job because if you think about it, what they need to know is that theoretical mathematical carrying capacity, that value for K. But how many lobsters, how many trees, how many shrimp, how many tilapia can one environment actually carry? What is the value of K? And pretty much it's impossible to tell, so it's very difficult then to find out what half of the number that you don't know is. And so because of that, not knowing what the population carrying capacity is, because we don't even know how many individuals there are. Think about the U.S. Census, right? These are people who are capable of answering questions about number of persons who live in their home, and yet it's so difficult to get that information that we don't even know how many humans there are exactly, let alone how many maple trees or how many shrimp or how many lobsters there are. And then what number that carrying capacity is, is also going to fluctuate as climactic conditions change, as the number of organisms living in an area changes. So too is the maximum ca carrying capacity for each individual or rather each population in that environment. And knowing then which individuals to harvest, how old should they be, right? You know that if you hunt or fish, there are certain age ranges where it is not permissible, not legal to hunt, shoot, capture. And so how do we de decide what age is suitable? And in terms of fighting infestations, Right? What should we go after? Which ones do we kill? Do we try to kill the females or do we try to kill the males? What about with populations outside of roaches, with ants, with bees, with anything else? So when we look at, this is a lovely roach infestation, um, generally it's considered optimal to go after the females because of course regardless of how many males there are in a population, 
as long as it's not hermaphroditic, meaning as long as they can't switch sexes, um, getting rid of the females will mean that you cannot have a next generation. So many times the purpose or the target of pesticides is to attack the females. And so again, pause the video while you think about the question and begin it again once you get your answer. And so hopefully you realize that choices three and four, that mathematically the maximum sustainable yield is half of the carrying capacity, but because we don't know what the value for K is, we really can't figure out what the maximum sustainable yield is either. Now, this brings us to life histories, which are shaped by natural selection. Life histories is how often and when an organism begins to reproduce. And so you see that there are various different strategies that different organisms employ. And please feel free to follow those links. Um, five, five animals that make themselves to death is the link to the video on the right. I believe that one's about three minutes. And the Antichinus, which is a marsupial mouse-like critter, um, that, again, the males mate themselves to death. Um, that's pretty cool, and it's about two minutes. Uh, so one strategy, as you see on the left in the table, is the Big Bang reproduction. And an example of that is the Antichinus, that little marsupial uh, rodent-looking critter. Um, they can reproduce beginning at the age of one, and what the males will do is intensely mate. They will pretty much literally do nothing other than mate and bouts lasting up to 12 hours and during this time they don't eat, they don't sleep, they don't drink and they become so physically and physiologically exhausted that their hair will start to fall out, their organs will start to fail, they become uh, incapable of fighting off infection and will die shortly after. So that's big bang. Mate, 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 do nothing but mate, find every female you can, rip them out of the tree and mate with them, and then die. And then uh, watch the video and they explain why this is actually an effective strategy and why natural selection would in fact select for it. Another is the fast, intense reproduction, like your standard rodents, the mice that we have here, the placental mice. Uh, mice can begin to reproduce at age one, at, uh, sorry, at one month, not one year, but at one month, and then every month they can have between six and ten pumps, which means that they can have upwards of 120 offspring each year, but they only tend to live for two to three years in the wild. So the more offspring you have, generally at the same time, the more frequently you reproduce, but the shorter the lifespan and the lower the life expectancy. If you're a mouse living in a field, chances are pretty good that a predatory bird, a cat, a snake, something's going to come and eat you. So despite the fact that they have so many offspring, they don't tend to all live to uh, sexual maturity. And the other option that, or selected for strategy for life history is the slow gradual reproduction. So bats cannot reproduce until around the age of one and then they'll tend to only have one offspring a year but they live a lot longer. They can live up to around 20 years in the wild. Of course many mammals also cannot reproduce for a period for a longer period of time and they have fewer offspring so domesticated cats and dogs don't generally reproduce until around age nine months and then they will tend to only have one litter per, at a time and they have fewer offspring. Then you get to animals like humans and of course we cannot reproduce until approximately age 12 to 14 depending on the individual. We'll tend to only have one offspring a year but we have a much longer life expectancy. So why all this variation? Why isn't it just, you know, everything does this? You know, which one is better than the others? Well, of course, as with any adaptation, there is no best. There is no ideal. It all depends on the situation and the different circumstances. So for different organisms, depending on how long they live and where they live and what predators are available, uh, they individually will be selected for when to reproduce, how often, and how large their litter will be 
once they do reproduce. And so for any species, the aspects of the life history are going to include that age of first reproduction, the probability of survival of the offspring, the probability of survival of the parents, the litter size, how frequent they have a litter, and the life expectancy for the individuals in that population. And this is often going to be tied with the reproductive investment. So how much time, how much energy is it going to take to have and to raise the offspring? In general, the more time the parents spend rearing the offspring, the fewer offspring they'll have. And mammals are an example of that. We rear our young, we tend to have relatively few young at one time, and we raise them for a longer period of time than, say, many fish. Fish will tend to have hundreds, if not thousands of, or lay hundreds, if not thousands of eggs at one period of time, but that's it. Their only investment is the production of the eggs or the sperm. Once the eggs are fertilized, the fish leave and they never see their offspring. The same with many, though not all, reptiles. They will lay their eggs, a large number of eggs, a clutch of tens to dozens, and then they leave and never see the offspring. So with relatively low reproductive investment, you can have a large number of offspring, but the opposite is you don't expect many of those offspring to grow and live until sexual maturation. So which of these strategies is best? And again, it's impossible to say because there is no ideal. It depends on how the organism lives and how long they can expect to live. So why do humans put off mating for so long? Even though we are reproductively viable, again, between ages 12 and 14 or so, uh, we don't tend to reproduce as soon as we are biologically able to. Whereas cats, mice, and many of the four-legged mammals will reproduce almost immediately. So think about that, and this is something that we might have for a discussion. Um, and hopefully you kind of already see the answer from what we've talked about before. So this was part two of population ecology.